Greetings all. <clears throat> well, <laughs> folks who've been around the channel for a while know that every once in a while, particularly around Halloween, I'll wander off on some strange subject that's got nothing to do with plants or fruits or gardens like UFOs, haunted houses, witches, who knows, you know. And then again, any old time I take a mind to spout off about something or another, I may just go ahead and do it here on the channel, whether it's about tomatoes or not. Well, yeah, it came to mind this morning that, well, since I tend to talk about Halloween, which is one of my more favorite holidays. Um, we're coming up on Christmas. Um, now Christmas is, at least these days, not one of my favorite holidays. Um, as a child, of course, living in Chicago, the snow coming down, all the green trees, the tinsel, the sparkly ornaments, the lights, the sitting on Santa's lap, which was pretty scary, personally. Yeah, you know, and all of that stuff. Sleds and so on. Top notch. Loved it. Yeah, just loved it. Couldn't wait, you know. <laughs> Try to get up early on Christmas morning and get a look at what I was getting and so on. Standard, standard kid joy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. But, you know, it, it, my family... Uh, that I grew up with my uh, uh, maternal grandparents um, you know, they were not Christian <laughs> okay they were not religious period okay so that was uh, basically a case of atheism um, yeah they so they didn't celebrate the holidays in that regard you know Christmas meant well we're having ham for dinner we were putting a Christmas tree up but of course they were Germans and uh, well, so much of this stuff is actually some German traditions, you know. Um, and so we did this whole thing, uh, and it was fun. And uh, I enjoyed the the uh, the elves and the reindeers and the cookies and the candy canes. You know, it was all great stuff. Yeah, fond memories. But, you know, times change. I'm... <laughs> These days, to me, uh, Christmas doesn't really mean much. I go through it, the motions, uh, just to keep from, you know, ticking other people off. Uh, there's a lot of people who are very, very deep in their beliefs on this whole thing. Um, I just, just love it. My partner, Ellen, is one, for instance, who cannot get off Christmas, man. She sends cards. She does the whole works. And, you know, well... I'm not that way, so we kind of try to find some middle ground, you know. So I, I go Christmas shopping for her. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a... Uh, I'm bad at it. I'm terrible at it. Yeah, people tell me uh, that, you know, women and people in general would prefer to get presents for Christmas that are like, you know, gifts of the heart, a piece of jewelry, you know, something on that order, as opposed to a practical item, which would, I suppose, you know, giving a dishwasher to your wife for Christmas is pretty much the same as when my aunt gave me socks when I was a boy. I guess that's how it goes out. We had these anticipations, you know, uh, dishwashers or socks, just don't cut it. Well, that's me. I can't usually ever think of anything other than practical gifting things I know the person needs in their life you know that's kind of where I'm at yeah I got by for years just by walking around with a bag of oranges and giving one to everybody I met you know Merry Christmas here yeah, Merry Christmas uh, you know the truth of the matter is is that uh, well I I really don't like Black Friday Ugh. I you know, Christmas has become a, kind of a capitalist shopping frenzy that distresses me. I'm not much of a consumer. I consume to survive. I don't survive to consume. And so the idea that, wow, let's go shopping! I'm going, no, I think I'll take a nap if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, oh, and then the rest of it, you know, it's like, it's kind of a, thinly veiled um, veneer 
of religion over the face of what apparently was uh, uh, ancient pagan rituals. You know, well, that's pretty much the way Christmas looks to me. And yeah, I mean, really, you ever ask yourself, this is supposed to be the birth of Christ, right? Um, well, m most theologians will agree, and this goes way back, uh, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, okay? That isn't how it happened. Uh, because of a, there was a conjunction of planets that occurred um, sometime around, uh, you know, the, that period of history, but I think it was more in October or something. Anyway, this conjunction of planets that a lot of people tend to believe, yeah, this was probably the story of the Star of Bethlehem. Yeah, that's probably, you know, where it came from. And uh, so that was in December. Uh, pretty much we end up with Christmas in December because uh, of the Feast of Saturnalia. Uh, Saturnalia. It was uh, um, a, a pagan ritual. Um, and then that was, you know, mostly in Rome. Uh, and they're the ones who actually kind of built Christmas. But the... Uh, Northern Europeans had their own solstice traditions, uh, you know, there were solstice type traditions that went around this time. Well, when the Romans went north into Europe, uh, mostly looking for wine grapes in France and other things that they didn't have good down in their country, uh, they brought with them uh, a sword and the Bible. Okay, and so they imposed uh, Christianity as they saw it on uh, the tribes that were existing in Europe at the time whose uh, native spiritual beliefs uh, would have been much more uh, like uh, what we call magic today. They would have been witchcraft, um, spells, charms, all sorts of different things that had nothing to do uh, with Christianity. It does and sometimes it amazes me, uh, you know, because I, I have no Jewish heritage at all, none whatsoever. And I always wondered why people were always talking about this Jewish kid, you know, and it's not part of my background, not part of my family history. It got nothing to do with anything that I know anything about. But they're going, this is important to you. And I'm going, well, I'm not part of that ethnicity. So, yeah, we all did. My family at one time had, you know, like I say, traditions. Uh, the good part of the maternal family existed outside the fences. Uh, in other words, Romans came in, they started setting out fences on lands as they conquered Europe. And, uh, you know, people inside the fences, basically, uh, you believed or you were put to the sword or something like that. It was a forced situation. Then there were the ones that lived outside the fences. They were the pagans. Um, that's kind of where my family was, <laughs> mostly. Yeah, we, we never got converted into Christianity. The, they still followed the ancient traditions. Both my grandparents, uh, <clears throat> their parents came here uh, to the United States as homesteaders. and Well, they really didn't carry too much with them. Most of anything that, that was once known uh, was lost. Um, my grandfather would have been the first one probably in that family who had actually tried to make an entry into the church at one point he decided to study in seminary in the 19th century he was going to become a priest well when they found out that grandpa thought he could talk to angels um, they excommunicated him he was thrown out on his butt uh, for for engaging in what they considered to be pagan behaviors you know these were probably demons that Adolf was talking to uh, could not possibly be angels um, and so on so well that made him angry as all get out he turned on the church 100 percent and so there's never any background this way in our family uh, so did you ever ask yourself though where did all the elves come from what is this with flying reindeers well, who is the fat man in the red suit in the beard you know because this is a real problem man when i was a boy this is this was my christmas uh, christmas background but then um when I became school age, the public school in my neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, which my uncle had attended, um, 
was exceedingly dangerous. It was a better place to probably die than it was to get an education. Uh, at least you know, get you know the heck pounded out of you. So mom made a decision that the two of us boys we were going to go to a Christian school in the same neighborhood. Um, and since my grandparents were Germans, uh, they chose the Lutheran school because Luther was a good German boy. And they teach me how to speak German. Uh, and, and they fed us some of the German food at, in the lunchroom, which, you know, <laughs> pork and sauerkraut was never my favorite. And one time with a case of developing stomach flu, I had one of these teachers who stand over you and go, eat your lunch, eat your lunch, wasting food is not godly, you know, with a ruler in his hand. And so he forced me to eat the pork and sauerkraut, which then immediately came back up and spewed with anything else that was in my stomach across all the kids on the other side of the table. I wish I could have seen the look on the yo-yo's face who made me eat it because, <laughs> yeah, well, so, so I ended up in this Lutheran school and I spent eight years uh, in parochial Lutheran education. But I apparently was a real problem for my teachers. Uh, I guess they had never run across an eight-year-old heretic. Yeah, because I didn't have any background this way. My culture did not really have anything to do with this religion uh, or any religion at all, really. Um, I had to try to accept it. And I tried. I mean, I don't know what they tell you these days, but in those days, basically, if you did not accept that you were going to hell, well, obviously going to hell was not a good place, and they scared the living pants out of me as a child that that might happen, yet I had my tendencies, and there was no way, you know, they kept telling me, you got to believe, you got to have faith, you got to believe, and I didn't believe it. There was very little of anything there that I could say, oh yeah, okay, this connects, I get it, you know. I didn't find that most of it actually fit the way of the world, the way I saw it, you know, that what they were teaching was contrary to, uh, even as a child, the way I saw things. I was forever in trouble in the principal's office. They'd find me with, you know, copies of books about dinosaurs and evolution of species hidden in my desk, could I be reading it, you know, lunch break or something, and they'd find that I'd get dragged to the office, there'd be a teacher's conference, you know, make it, as in a way, kind of a repeat of what my grandfather had gone through, too, with religion. Um, you know, they, I was bad, I shouldn't be reading these things, this was not acceptable, uh, Darwin and evolution were evil and they were wrong, uh, you know, and all the, you know, the whole myth story that Christians put forward 5,000 years ago, the world was formed. It happened in uh, six days, and the seventh day he rested, and so on, you know. And there was a Garden of Eden with an Adam and Eve and, and uh, a serpent. And Well, I didn't buy it. <laughs> and so that caused problems. And for me, it causes tremendous dichotomy because around Christmas time, we have to learn to sing all the, you know, religious Christmas songs, we have big pageants and, you know, family comes to church and, you know, all that stuff. Well, I mean, I like the singing. I love pageantry. And so I, well, part of it was okay with me. But when it came down to this conflict between what, this is the day Christ was born? Well, well what's with the fat man in the suit? Okay. Yeah, couldn't get it together. Not at all, they didn't m mix. Well, it took a long time, but years later I began to recover from my education, what it had done to me. Uh, it had warped my thinking badly. Uh, it was the most damaging experience of my life, I think, past the Vietnam draft and, and divorce and, and total abandonment and a few other things, you know. <laughs> There's a few things in life that'll mess you up, but that was one of them. Uh, it took me the longest time, forever, boy, to figure my way through all that. Yeah. Um, well, with enough research, I finally drew the conclusion that what we were dealing with was kind of an overlap. Christmas is a lamination. We have initially 
what was uh, uh, ancient rituals uh, around the uh, um, the uh, uh, solstice uh, and around the return of the light. Uh, it's, they often call Christ the light, and that is exactly why, because there was celebration on the 21st or thereabout of the return of the light coming back to the land, you know. Um, the darkness was hard on people, couldn't grow crops, so on. You could starve during that period. It was a harsh time, you know. And so when the light came back, it meant that one of these days, spring would return, and we would once again sow barley, you know, and go about our lives. Uh, and the evergreen tree was uh, uh, also part of all of this because it kind of symbolized the eternal nature of, of secular seasons and the earth going around and so on, you know. That's, uh, that's where we get the eternal life concept here. Uh, it came to us actually through uh, ancient traditions as well as the light and the return of... Uh, I have no idea idea <laughs> for sure so i won't try to state fact here because they gave me a lot of garbage when i was in school but the lutherans believe martin luther was the one who invented the christmas tree and yeah, already had this pagan thing going on with burning the yule log okay and uh, um you know and that sort of stuff yeah, around trees and evergreen trees and this eternal life around evergreen trees and so on so again as an act of attempting to try to cover all of this paganism up um, Martin Luther supposedly dragged a, a tree inside and stuck candles in it to celebrate the holiday and assigned this to uh, the ritual of celebrating the birth of Jesus and that's, that's what I was told I don't know whether it's true. The whole thing, as I said, it's a feast of Saturnalia, actually. And, you know, there was a point in history around the time of Constantine, the first Holy Roman Emperor, uh, where Constantine's predecessors had been hurling Christians to lions, and they just kept going to the lions. Whatever it was these guys believed in, they believed in it to the grave. He said, man, that's more powerful than anything that my citizens have. Um, they won't go to the grave for most of what they believe in. So, he adopted Christianity as the official religion of Rome. That's how we get the Holy Roman Church. That's where Catholicism comes from. That's why the Vatican is in Rome. That's why the Vatican is its own country in the middle of Italy, and so on and so forth, and the largest real estate holder on the planet, etc., etc. Um, yeah, it was adopted mostly for political reasons. There was power. Yeah, Constantine saw it this way. He says, when my soldiers and police aren't watching you, God is watching you, so watch it, buddy. Okay? Yeah, it was an extension of political power. And at the time, this is when the text that we call the Bible was created. It was created. Okay. Um, there was so much writing in those days about the Christ figure. So much. Uh, it's just a tremendous amount of, of stuff that had been accumulated by so many different people. Um, you know, some of it dangerously heretical, like the Dead Sea Scrolls buried and hidden so they wouldn't be destroyed and so on. Um, this type of thing happened. Well, what happened is a Roman church went through and with a bunch of their bishops and whatnot, they said, nope, not this one. Yep, this one. Nope, not that. Mm -mm, this one. Um, they had one big problem, and that was with feminism because uh, the ancient um, pagan rituals, they were really very much based in goddesses. It was a very strong feminine presence, and um, no, they didn't want any of that coming through. So if you ever wondered one reason why, wow, all the disciples were men, uh, you know, and why everything, you know, God is the Father, uh, etc. You know, yeah, they tried to throw all the feminine aspect, which was earth magic uh, in those days, out of the religion. And so as they sorted, they trashed a lot of stuff. They put the rest of it together. They said, here's the work of God. And as they moved north into Europe, you know, people were put to that sword. I have one uh, 
uh, friends, deep friends, Ukrainians, who actually came from a part that was outside the fences. And to this day, uh, their, Alex's mother was still a practicing Ukrainian witch, the traditional beliefs of Ukraine. Um, yeah, she could <laughs> say magic words to a string, tie it around your wart and make it go away, etc used herbal preparations to cure all sorts of things yeah alex's mom was a witch by the terms that we would interpret for her this was religion because she'd never lost the original religion of her land see um well i don't know with that I, i'm not trying to take anybody's uh, beliefs away in jesus uh, i'll say right off that i truly believe that jesus existed um I don't believe he was born on the day they claim he was born, but uh, I also believe he was extraordinary. How extraordinary, I don't know. When people start putting things to pen, as you know these days, if they exaggerate, they do a lot of things. So I don't know, and so because I don't know, I don't pass judgment. I have no idea. Um, I've seen some pretty extraordinary things myself in this world, um, so I tend to believe this was real yeah, yeah, yeah i believe <laughs> jesus existed and he walked on this earth but i also believe that so did muhammad and so did buddha you know and on and on uh, i believe there are people who are very special spiritually and uh, so so i'm not trying to diss the myth of Jesus Christ. I'm just saying he wasn't really born on this day. <laughs> and uh, uh, what we're doing here is we've been trying to hide something else that wants to come up from underneath. Yeah, you know, as I grew older, I, I could clearly see what we'd been doing uh, all this time and that what we had was almost an ancient mythology written in code. Elves, flying reindeers, fat men with red beard, beards and red clothes, you know, the sleighs, and this whole thing, the trees, you know. It's all ancient mythology that goes back before Christianity came into Europe. Um, it is the traditional belief systems. Yeah, and uh, it's hidden underneath. Easter is the same way. I mean, come on, uh, this is when Christ was crucified, all right, it, but what's it got to do with bunnies and eggs? <laughs> you know, we're back to estrus again, fertility cults, <laughs> bunnies and eggs, man, okay? Um, then again, it's, but there's the story of the crucifixion. It's a layered sandwich. Yeah, we have several different mythologies that are packed together uh, on these holidays and it makes it really kind of strange and interesting at the same time because as a young man I began to read the code. And I started looking beneath the surface which is the kind of thing I do whether it's in gardening, anything, politics, I don't care. I don't take the surface value and I don't take the first opinion. I dig. I'm a gopher. And I dig in and I look and I want to know. I want to know the deeper meanings of things in life. This is just my nature. You know, some people are happy with the surface. They're good there. They don't like going deep. I get the joy out of digging. And so what I found was a whole lot of ancient pagan symbols, almost like a language, that were speaking to me through these holidays. Somewhere around 1970, a young man uh, I was into harvesting wild edible mushrooms but I didn't have a lot of knowledge my family had lost the traditional knowledge that had allowed both the, the grandparents and great-grandparents uh, in past generations to be able to actually safely pick these fungi but uh, my generation my parents generation had completely lost it they were not interested so i had to study mycology from the scientific viewpoint rather than uh, you know use the uh, the herbal wisdom uh, that had been used on this when i was in the local public library small town palatine illinois had a fair library 
and I'm going through tomes on mushrooms. It almost fell off the shelf into my hand. It was a book by a man named John Allegro called The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. Well, having eight years of Christian education and being pretty interested in mushrooms, I thought, this is a read. So I, I took it home with me. So I'm just this young man, I was still a teenager, you know, I was a draft age right about then. Uh, and uh, well, I read it and I was amazed at what I found. It, it took me a little while to really assimilate the information that John Allegro had left in this book. Um, if you don't know who he is, he was a archaeologist who was capable of reading the ancient languages of the Middle East. Very few people can read ancient Aramaic and some of these uh, languages. John could. Otherwise, uh, there were people within the church, Catholic Church, Rome, bishops and whatnot, who also were scholars and could read these languages. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Uh, the, these were part of the scriptures that had been hidden, uh, probably from the Romans, who knows who exactly, but they were hidden to keep them from being burned because there was a lot of burning of stuff in those days, destruction of, uh, you know, the, and so these were basically pretty much uh, the New Testament. Most of it was pretty much the New Testament, and a lot of it was uh, absolutely parallel, exact almost, you know, but a lot of it wasn't. No, it was left by the, a, a group of uh, Christians called the Essene, and they were different. Yeah, they, their belief system was not quite the same at all as the standard church as it had developed. Well, Allegro was the only secular man ever assigned by the Vatican to the translation of the scrolls. All the others were religious figures. What happened is, as the scrolls were translated, many things came to light in these translations that had been part of early Christianity that the Roman church did not want entered into reality these days. Okay, uh, things like, for instance, uh, references to uh, Christ actually having been married, okay, with the possibility that he had children. There is a uh, fringe Christian sect to this day that still seeks the bloodline of Christ. Uh, I believe they've traced it to somewhere in France, uh, which is where supposedly uh, the children had escaped to at one point uh, when their dad was crucified. So, oh, you had other things in there, too, that the church wanted nothing to do with. Okay, a lot of feminism, and I mean, a lot of uh, female people in there who were disciples, actually, and had contributions to things in Christianity, which had all been thrown out by the Romans, uh, you know. Too much earth magic there, too much earth goddess stuff with these feminine figures, so they were dumped. Um, one of the things that Allegro came up with <laughs> was landmark earth shaking and that is it appears that early Christianity actually utilized a mushroom sacrament. Now today a lot of us who follow this around realize that say the psilocybe mushroom for instance is being used a little bit in modern psychology where it's being allowed by laws it's very heavily prohibited but it's been loosening up and in some places you can study it like oakland denver uh, portland i believe you know and you can actually find practitioners who may even allow you to lose the mushroom under their guidance and so on um, it's been used as a psychological aid and uh, some of the results are amazing but there's a lot of us that understand that this mushroom is the key in most cases to spiritual awakening well ancient christians apparently also understood this now whether they were using a psilocybe or whether they were using the ammonita muscaria which is the red mushroom with the white flecks, you know, 
just they make salt and pepper shakers that look like it and all this junk okay well we're not sure we don't know what the mushroom was but according to allegro the use existed and it was one of the things that drove early christianity um, so well the church <laughs> the church wanted no part of potential mushroom cults connected to jesus and so it was all thrown out the bishops and that they were doing the translations it was stopped and they never really finished uh, at the vatican the translations translations continue today it's still ongoing allegro was one of the only men at the time with the part of it he was assigned to who actually finished but you know he was a secular man he didn't have religious beliefs that were in his way that would stop him in disbelief from what he was finding and so he completed the work well at the end of it he then wrote a book and the book was called the sacred mushroom in the cross um, there is an audio book of this uh, seven hours long <laughs> on uh, YouTube I will leave the link if you're interested in reading it hardbound or paperback, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, I won't bother with a link on that, but yeah, you could read it. The book's out there. I found it a fascinating read. Now, here's what I learned about Christmas from John Allegro. John Allegro went deeper than um, what he found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He extrapolated much of the fact that it appears uh, ancient mushroom cults actually existed at one time. Um, he attributes the Soma listed in the Bhagavad Gita uh, um, uh, as being a, 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 mash, a mushroom. Yeah, this is a, a Hindu thing, Hindu beliefs. Uh, in, in their writings, uh, there is an item called Soma. And uh, Allegro assumed it probably had to be a mushroom. It was a substance that was taken that enhanced the spiritual experience of people. Um, well, this had Allegro looking at what is the history of uh, shamanism in Northern Europe uh, and any rituals associated in Northern Europe with the solstice. Well, <laughs> boy, was that a shaking thing, because uh, it turns out that Siberian shamans, uh, for instance, well-documented, still happens today. Okay. Siberian shamans will go out into the woods in fall mostly in taiga, you know, it's spruce trees and such. And they will find Amanita muscaria growing. This is the red mushroom, white polka dots. Okay, it's archetypical fungi. <laughs> um, the classic toadstool. And, uh, well, they'd, they'd harvest them. Well, mushrooms spoil easily, and so to dry the fungi, the shamans would take the fungi and skewer them on twigs in the spruce trees, those evergreen Christmas trees. They would cover them in red and white fungi to dry them during the fall. Uh, now this is something the shamans didn't think up because at one time while harvesting mushrooms in spruce bogs in northern Wisconsin, I suddenly had a mushroom hit me in the head. I said, that's most unusual. Why are the mushrooms falling from space? So I looked up into the trees and what I discovered, the squirrels know how to harvest, dry, and store mushrooms. They're smart enough genetically, their instincts, they know that if they put fresh mushrooms away in their little cubby holes, they're going to turn into slime and mold. So instead, the squirrels have learned to skewer the fungi on the tree branches. They dry in the trees. Then they take the dried mushrooms and put them away as food source for the winter. Well, the wind blew, they were falling out of the trees, hit me in the head. And immediately I thought back to Allegro's story of the shamans in Siberia hanging mushrooms in trees to dry. Well, Later on, they'd come back through and they'd harvest their mushrooms. Well, they would harvest their mushrooms in big sacks. 
okay? I put them away and they'd wait until the winter came and around the 21st of the year, which was where we would celebrate solstice, you know, um, the shamans would travel between the villages in Siberia. Now, of course, they didn't have cars and walking through all that snow would be a hard darn thing to do and so the shamans used sleighs. Mm -hmm. They used sleighs and sleds to move around uh, between the villages in winter. Well, of course, they didn't have horses up there or water buffaloes and oxen. What they had were ah, reindeer. Yeah, reindeer. And they'd hitch reindeer to <laughs> sleighs. This is real. Okay, it's real. It still goes on today in some places. Then they'd go ahead and they'd take their sacks of mushrooms and they'd toss them into the sleighs. And the shamans celebrating the fungi, which are red and white, would traditionally dress in red, red and white garb. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> they'd decorate evergreen trees with red and white mushrooms. They'd put them in sacks. They'd throw them in sleighs pulled by reindeers wearing red and white clothes, okay? Um, and, of course, these were magic mushrooms. They were mushrooms that would intoxicate you. They would give you deep experiences. Well, as they traveled between the villages, the snow would get deep. Often, the doorways to the hutches that people lived in would be snowed under. And so, shaman had to come down the smoke hole, aka chimney, at the top of these buildings with a sack of dried mushrooms over his shoulders. Mm -hmm. And these mushrooms were a real gift to people, okay? And so, I imagine that people probably, and this goes to Cookie and Belk, that they probably fed the shamans in exchange, they probably did nice things for the shamans, and the shamans probably gave them mushrooms, all right? This is what Allegro says. Well, Okay, so the mushrooms induced hallucinogenic states. Hey, flying reindeer, yeah. And these, the, the, this was all about ancient European magic, okay, uh, the spiritual beliefs there. And so, you know, sprinkle a little magic mushroom dust on your reindeer and they suddenly their noses glow when they're flying through the sky or whether they're flying through the sky or the shaman just feels like we're flying through the sky doesn't really matter does it i'm sure the elves come in here someplace and in, in that one i can't actually say other than they really do fit into the whole mushroom thing there's a lot of people with psilocybin mushrooms that believe um, that there are entities ayahuasca is like that, that there are entities and uh, I know Terence McKenna refers to uh, these entities as self-replicating machine elves uh, that they are somewhat elf-like uh, yeah, so there you go and Allegro's story is quite real um, like I say, he is an archaeologist he's highly educated um, you know you know, just hand some guy the Dead Sea Scrolls and go interpret this stuff. So this guy's not a loon uh, by any means whatsoever. And boy, I was moved when I read this stuff. I'm going, oh my God, it all fits. It all fits together. And, and then, of course, when the Romans come north, uh, you know, looking for better grapes and land and whatever they were looking for, uh, when they took England and, you know, Germany and France and places like that. Um, they naturally had to drive all of this out because th there was a concerted effort <laughs> by the Romans to make sure that Christianity was the, the spiritual belief of the land. And so a lot of it got driven out, but just like in Latin America where you still find uh, deities from, you know, the Aztecs or the Mayans, you know, the, the Inca, it's still existing, you know, veneered with Christianity, you know, Catholicism mostly, you know, they kind of merged the two. Well, that's pretty much the story of Christmas.
but it's the European story of when we lost our spiritual traditions. If you happen to be white and of European origin, I'm 60% uh, uh, German Czech. Yeah, so that would have been my tradition historically that was lost. I do find it rather amazing, you know, we get uh, oh, Hawaiians here trying to, you know, make sure they're preserving their traditional languages, beliefs, and so on, songs, you know, you, you get to uh, the mainland and you do have tribes and Native Americans, despite the concerted effort by the U.S. government to stamp their original beliefs out, who are still maintaining and persisting a certain percentage of the traditional practices. Um, Europeans, well, Catholic Church ran the Inquisition. And in the Inquisition, they, they burned, they drowned, they you know, murdered in many different ways uh, most practitioners of ancient European magic. And they managed to push it so it became completely underground. Most people didn't even know it existed. Most people in Europe had no idea that their traditional spiritual beliefs had been robbed from them by the Romans uh, by force, you know, and so today we have this whole group of people who came out of Europe who believe their traditions are Christianity. Well, they weren't. They are now. And so what we get is this hybrid thing with elves, flying reindeers, the mushrooms hanging in trees, <laughs> and the birth of Christ yeah, in, in, this, in the Bethlehem story and all that. Yeah. So there is Bill's weird story about how does Christmas come about? It's pretty close, folks. Yeah, you could argue with it if you want to. I don't know everything by any means at all, you know. But uh, it's a fascinating story, and what I come across, it rings pretty well. In some cases, the Siberian shaman story in Santa Claus is just incredible. The parallel when I found it in Allegro's book. So, you know, aloha, folks. Y'all hang loose. Uh, don't eat too many mushrooms over the holidays.